أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد الرسول الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله حي على الصلاة الحمد لله رب العالمين والعاقبة للمتقين ولا عدوان إلا على الظالمين وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن دعا بدعوته واستنى بسنتي إلى يوم الدين وسلم تسليما كثيرا أما بعد فأوصيكم ونفسي بالتقوى الله عز وجل والسمع والطاعة ويقول الحق سبحانه يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يتع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما All praise are due to Allah, Lord of the worlds and surely the best reward ultimately is for those who have taqwa. And surely there is no animosity, no ill feeling, except for the oppressor. And I bear witness that Allah is one and has no partners. And that Muhammad, the son of Abdullah, is his servant. to his way and establish his sunnah to the day of judgment. As to what follows, I begin by reminding myself and you of the critical importance of the consciousness of Allah, taqwa Allah Azza wa Jal, and that we hear the words of Allah, we truly listen to the words of Allah, we truly obey them and we obey the messenger, peace and blessings be upon him. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed to us in his mighty book, O you who believe, have the consciousness of Allah and speak a straightforward word. He would repair your deeds, forgive you of your sins. And whoever obeys Allah and his messenger has surely gained a mighty triumph. O you who believe, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us a formula that we should go through our lives and no, ma no matter what happens, we remember that there is one mighty in power that ultimately Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
will bring justice to this world. And in our lives, we need to focus on our lives. And it is so important right now because every single Muslim with an ounce of Iman in his heart or her heart is feeling pain right now. And that pain could turn into rage. But Allah Azza wa Jal tells us, tells us in the second chapter, verse 183, Ya ayyuha alladhina amanu in tattaqullaha yaj'al lakum furqanan wa yukaffir ankum sayyi'atikum wa yaghfir lakum wallahu dhu fadl azim O you who believe, if you have taqwa, if you have the consciousness of Allah, keep your duty to Allah, then He will grant you a distinction, a furqan. Allah will give you a furqan and he will, he will do away with your evils and forgive you of your sins and Allah is the Lord of mighty grace. One of the great scholars of Islam along with others looking into this word al-furqan. It is a critical word today as we move toward the day of judgment. Al-furqan is to... Uh, to, to separate al-haq from batil, to be able to separate truth from falsehood. And Imam al-Shawkani rahimahullah told us that furqan also means tabat al-qulub wa quwwat al-basair wa husn al-hidayah. Three important qualities that we need right now, every single Muslim in our lives. Tabat al-qulub, that our hearts become consolidated. We are watching this, never mind the people suffering under the bombs, suffering the pain. We are watching this confusion happening right in front of our lives. Many people read it in the books. They read about the Mongols. We read about the Crusaders. We read about the Nazis, but we never thought that this could happen directly in our own lives. And so we have to keep connecting to Allah that our hearts can remain solid in this difficult time. And the second quality, quwwat al-basair, that is insight, the strength of having insight into the affairs. There is so much confusion, so much deception in this world. And that leads to husn al-hidayah, that is the guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we need in this time of darkness. Because we are moving toward the day of resurrection at breakneck speed. And the Prophet ﷺ was reported to have said on the authority of Anas ibn Malik, Ahmed. <laughs> The Prophet ﷺ is reported to have said, verily preceding the false Messiah, the Antichrist, will be years of deception, in which the truthful are treated as liars, the liars are believed, the trustworthy are discredited, the treacherous are trusted, and the disgraceful ones speak out. And they asked, who is this Ruwaybidah? And the Prophet ﷺ said, little wicked men who will speak out on behalf of the masses of the people. And Sadaqa Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it has come to pass. But this Taqwa Allah is rising in the Ummah. And alhamdulillah, the ummah is waking up all over the planet. 
in Europe, in Asia, in the Americas, even down into Chile in South America, way to the Philippines, in Korea. The Ummah is waking up. This new generation of people is a different generation. It's not the bend the knees generation. It's not bow down generation. But it is, we are standing up, and the more we stand up, the more we have straightforward knowledge, solid yaqeen, reality, is the more we will be prepared psychologically and mentally for what is to come. And so let's set things straight, especially for the younger generation, because there are many young people who are not aware of what has happened in the past. There are many people who do not study the history of this region, who are shocked at the information coming over our radios and our televisions and our elected leaders. Shocked by this. But it is ilmun nafia. It is beneficial knowledge that will open up our eyes. Number one, the Palestinian people are the indigenous people of this region. Just like in Canada, we have indigenous people, Iroquois, we have the Mohawk, we have the different indigenous people who lived for thousands of years here in Canada. Palestinian people are the indigenous people of that land. And there is recorded proof around 4,500 BC of the people of Canaan, the Canaanites, living in this region. In 2000 BC, recorded proof of people Amoriyin, Amorites, Phoenicians, tribes from Crete, from the Mediterranean, coming into this region and settling in this land. So when Nabi Ibrahim alayhi salam established Al-Aqsa, the people living around, the believers at that time were the indigenous people. They were the Palestinian people. And they took care of this masjid, this area, for 400 years. And it wasn't until the time of Yusha, because Musa alayhi salam never went in, but Yusha was given permission to go in to establish Tawheed around 1255 BC. But the majority of the people living in the region were still the Palestinian people. From that time, there were many conquerors that came. Persians conquered, Babylonians conquered, Greeks conquered, Romans conquered. In 63 BC, the Romans officially called their province Philistine. In 63 BC, they officially called that area Philistine. Just after the death of the Prophet ﷺ, when Muslims responded to the Romans, and defeated the Romans and opened up this area. The Khalifa Umar ibn Khattab an, established waqaf. He established a trust that the Muslims should be in charge of this place until the day of judgment. That Muslims are responsible, not just the people in the area, but all over the world are responsible for this area. And it wasn't except for a few brief 80 years or so with Crusaders until the 20th century that this land was conquered by the Europeans. But still, especially for young people, in 1917, 99% of the territory belonged to the Palestinians. 99%. These are the indigenous people. But by 1948, using the powers of the West, Palestinian people were driven out. Terrible slaughters happened to them until 750,000 people were forced to flee. Today there are over 7.2 million Palestinian refugees. Let's get things straight. This struggle did not start two weeks ago. 
Gaza is the largest concentration camp on earth. There are over 6,000 Palestinian people in the Israeli jails. Constant attacks are being done by the settlers. Every day something is happening to people. Masjid al-Aqsa, established by Ibrahim Salam, our masjid, is constantly under attack. And this is not new. This is something that's been going on over and over again. So the present so-called war, it is not a war, it's a massacre. It is based upon all this oppression that happened in the land. And the reality is, and I say this to the younger generation, for you who will live longer than us, you are witnessing genocide. And genocide has been studied. It has been studied. And there are certain points. There are certain stages of genocide. Think about this. There are mass genocides that have taken place in the world. Number one, classification. That the people are classified as the other. They're classified according to their race, according to their religion, according to their ethnicity. That has happened now. Two, symbolization. Symbols of Islam, the hijab, masjid, so-called word Islamic jihad. Symbolization, to put fear in the hearts of people, Islamophobic symbolization. Three, discrimination. This is not Muslims that wrote this. These are people who study genocide. The third stage is discrimination where the people are excluded from civil rights. That is happening right now. Four, dehumanization, equating the people with insects and animals. The defense minister called our people human animals. It's here. Five, organization, special militias, groups of thugs, like the settlers, who are organized. Number six, polarization, hate speech, propaganda, up until our own city. Our own elected officials, our boards of education. Seven, preparation. The victims are identified. They are isolated. And the mass killings are planned. Number eight, persecution which is forced displacement. Look at the people being displaced from the northern part of Gaza, displaced to the southern part of Gaza, and still bombed. Number nine, extermination. And now we're seeing this happening in front of our eyes. And 10, denial. That the perpetrators deny that they committed any crimes. And we see it happening. All the stages of genocide are in place. But we need to be clear with one point. Because being Muslim is not an easy thing. We have to be balanced. Our enemy is not the Jewish people. It is not Christian people. On October 18th, over 300 people from the American Jewish community went to Washington, D.C. They have wrapped themselves up. They have said, not in our name. They have been arrested. Even some of their rabbis, 22 of their rabbis, have gone to protest this situation. This is some of the things that their own Jewish people are saying. Not in our name. Our blood is the same color. My grief is not your weapon. Cease fire now. And they said to President Biden, please investigate over 75 years of ethnic cleansing. This is not Muslims. The Jewish Voice of Peace is a national anti-Zionist organization. Christian people, the patriarchs and the heads of the churches in Jerusalem, 
They said, we the patriarchs and heads of churches in Jerusalem join together in profound solidarity with the Epis Episcopal Diocese of Jerusalem as we bear witness to the criminal act that unfolded within the precincts of Al Ahli Anglican Hospital. We vehemently denounce what is going on. What should we do? We cannot sit still. This is a new phase in our existence. Every person has to do something. We have to demand that the siege is lifted. We have to demand hum humanitarian aid has to come through the borders to the people right now. It's in front of a, don't tell me 20 trucks. If somebody stabbed you in the back and then pulled the knife halfway out, you're still stabbed. So don't tell me 20 trucks. It's insult to injury. We have to speak out. We have to demonstrate, and I say this to the young people especially with strength, we have to demonstrate and it means civil disobedience. Do not destroy property in this country. Do not attack innocent people. But make noise. Make noise. So they can be heard in our city. We must support advocacy groups. I appeal to you to support the National Council of Canadian Muslims, NCCM. They are on the front lines and they are in need of financial support now. They're defending us. So those of us who have wealth, find their website. Support them, as well as supporting Penny Appeal and all of our groups, which are helping the innocent people. We have to pressure our political leaders on all levels. Stop the genocide. Cease fire. What is wrong with this? This is not Canadian. This is not civilization. Stop the massacre of people. It has to ring louder and louder and louder until our voices are heard, our actions will be heard. And it's happening all around the world. You're not alone. People all around the world are now rising up. This is a new phase in our existence. And we have to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala above all to have mercy upon all those who are dying under the bombs. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy on the children of Palestine and the Umm of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give dignity and honor to the women of the Umm of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raise up strong men, strong leaders in the Muslim world to take our confused political leaders from darkness into light. And may Allah accept us all. May Allah accept the shahada. May Allah accept the martyrs who have fallen in Gaza, who have fallen in Palestine and the West Bank. May Allah accept them and send their souls directly to paradise, to Jannah al Firdos. And may Allah have mercy on us that we can be strong enough to stand and move in back of them. Aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullahi wa lakum wa li sa'iri muslimin min kulli dhambin astaghfiru innahu hu ghafurur rahim. Alhamdulillah, al wahid al-Ahad, al-Fardu samad al-Ladhi lam yalid wa lam yulad, wa lam yakul lahu kufuwan ahad. Wa usalli wa usallam ala sayyid al-awwaleen wa al-akhirin, nabiyana Muhammadan, wa ala alihi wa sahbihi, wa barak wa sallam. Ya ibadullah, attaqullah haythu ma kuntum, wa yakul al-haq subhana mukhbiran wa amida, إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل وسلم على عبدك ورسولك محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين ورد الله عن الخلفاء الراشدين أبو بكر عمر عثمان وعلي وأنا برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتري لولا هدانا الله ربنا لا تزيق قلوبنا بعد إذ هديتنا 
وهب لنا من لدنك رحمة إنك أنت الوهاب اللهم أعز الإسلام والمسلمين اللهم أعز الإسلام والمسلمين اللهم أعز الإسلام والمسلمين وذل الشرك والمسركين ودمع أعداء الدين وانصر عبادك يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم انصر إخواننا المرابطين في فلسطين وفي كل مكان يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم من أرادنا بسوء فاشغله في نفسي واجعل كيده في نحري واجعل تأبيره تدميره برحمتك يا ذا الجلال والإكرام O oh Allah whoever wants harm to us and our lands keep them busy with their own troubles return their plots to their own necks make their plans the cause of their own destruction Ya Rabbil Alameen Allahumma alayka bil sahayina al ghasibin fa innahum la yu'jizunak Allahumma shattit shamlahum wa farrik jamahum wa khalif bayna qalubihim wa farrik kalimatahum wa jal ba'sahum baynahum Allahumma shfi sudur qawm al-mu'mineen Allahumma shfi sudur qawm al-mu'mineen Allahumma la tada'alana dhamban illa ghafarta wa la hamman illa farrajta wa la daynan illa qadayta ولا ميتا إلا رحمته ولا حاجة من هواج الدنيا إلا قديتها يا أرحم الراحمين وقوموا إلى صلاتكم يرحمكم الله الله أكبر الله أكبر أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله حي على الصلاة حي على الفلاح قد قامت الصلاة قد قامت الصلاة الله أكبر صلوا صلاة ودع استووا الله أكبر الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين السماء ذات البروج واليوم الموعود والشاهد ومشهود قتل أصحاب الأخدود النار ذات الوقود إذ هم عليها قعود وهم على ما يفعلون بالمؤمنين شهود وما نقموا منهم إلا أن يؤمنوا بالله العزيز الحميد الذي له ملك السماوات والأرض والله على كل شيء شهيد إن الذين فتنوا المؤمنين والمؤمنات ثم لم يتوبوا ثم لم يتوبوا فلهم عذاب جهنم ولهم عذاب الحريق إن الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات لهم جنات تجري تجري من تحتها الأنهار ذلك الفوز الكبير الله أعلم سمع الله لمن حمد الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم 
مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين إن شربك لشديد إنه هو يبدي وعيد وهو الغفور الودود ذو العرش المجيد فعال لما يريد هل أتاك حديث الجنود فرعون وثود بل الذين كفروا في تكذيب والله من ورائهم محيط بل هو قرآن مجيد في لوح محفوظ الله أكبر سمع الله لمن حمد الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر السلام عليكم ورحمة الله
that demonize us or cell phone screens now that demonize us. Terrorism in its naked, pure form just means when mass violence is carried forward, uh, driven by a specific political ideology. And the political ideology driving mass murder is what? Who knows? What is it? What is it? Brother, what's the name of this ideology? Starts with a Z. Zionism. Zionism is the ideology that is driving the genocide in Gaza. Right? And what is Zionism? There's a lot of myths as to what Zionism is. There's a lot of misunderstanding as to what Zionism is. I don't have much time, but I'm going to break it down for you. Right? I've read all the books. I've read Edward Said. I've read all the scholars who've broken down this ideology and what it actually means. You may be surprised to know that Zionism was spawned as a secular ideology. It wasn't rooted in religion. It wasn't rooted in Judaism. The organization that spearheaded Zionism and that established the modern Zionist state, the state of Israel, was called the World Zionist Organization Rooted Europe. It was led by a number, a, a cabal, right, a secret sort of society of white men, white secular men, who decided that they wanted to establish a secular state of Israel atop the heads of Palestinians who had lived there for centuries. What is this, what this is called, and this is the language I want you to use when you talk about this on your timelines, on social media, to friends, this is called settler colonialism. This is when a foreign power invades, settles, and then displaces an indigenous power. We've seen this before. We've seen this before in my country, the United States. We call it manifest destiny, right? This idea that these white guys from England, right, they believe divinely that, you know, uh, God gave them the authority to travel thousands of miles away from home, kick off these indigenous tribes and nations who had settled the soil and developed it, raised children, but it was their entitlement they believed through God, right? They didn't see Islam as a bona fide religion then, right? They didn't see Indians as fully fledged human beings. They called them savages. So they exterminated them all, right? They genocided them all. They ethnically ethnically cleansed them all, right? Until there was like 5% of them left and they pushed them on to reservations. The history here in Canada with settler colonialism isn't dramatically different, right? It's a story of a similar tone and a similar tenor. country was a sovereign nation since before Montreal was a sovereign nation they lived there before there was ever such a thing as the United States or a Canada or the state of Israel all of these governments now that are conspiring giving money endorsing financing facilitating whatever words you want to use to justify ethnic cleansing based on the same stereotypes, based on the same tropes. That Arab and Palestinians are uncivilized. They said that about the Indians, right? That Arab and Palestinians are warmongering and backwards and violent. They said that about the Indians. That Arab and Palestinians would be unable to make the desert bloom, right? They wouldn't be able to maximize the potential in the capacity of the land. They said that about the Indians. They said that about Africans in Africa. They say it about everyone who doesn't look like them and believe like them. This is the same story, but a different chapter. We've seen it happen 
in history over and over and over and over again to people who have our skin complexion or darker skin complexions or who believe in our faith. But every single time, these stories have been on the wrong side of history. They've been on the wrong side of history. Let me share something with you, and many of you may know, I'm a law professor, I teach law for a living. Young don't know that, they just, they just think I'm this dude on, spends too much time on social media. But social media is powerful, right? The first, the first um, post I put up when they invaded Gaza was a quote from Malcolm X. Malcolm X is one of my heroes, right? Malcolm X is not even arguably, but the most prominent famous Muslim in North American history. Maybe Muhammad Ali rivals them, but those are the two, and they're both my heroes, right? I'm 40-some years old, and I've spent my entire life researching this stuff, writing about Islamophobia, and fully understanding that one of the most powerful outlets, one of the most powerful mechanisms that perpetuate the demonization of our people, whether Palestinian or Pakistani, whether African-American, Right, or Arab, whether Uyghur, Muslim, or Rohingya, is the media, right? In three de six decades before the war on terror, and before we see what's unfolding right now in Palestine, Malcolm X had it right. He wrote the book. He saw what was coming, right? He wrote, if you're not careful, the media will have you loving those people doing the oppressing and hating the people being oppressed. You guys have heard that before, right? That was the first post I put up knew what was gonna happen. I knew what the next days and weeks were gonna look like as the propaganda machines, I'll be frank with you, right? We're seeing in very graphic, stark, naked form these bombs falling atop hospitals and then they're blaming us for doing it, right? We're seeing the bombs falling atop churches and mosques, two churches in 24 hours. And brothers, we're all Muslims in this room, alhamdulillah. But me, I'm just as angry as when they bomb a church as when they do a mosque. Just as angry. I knew what was going to happen that before the actual war, the conventional war rolled forward, the propaganda war was going to begin first. Right? CNN and MSNBC and Fox News and the BBC and CBC, all of them were going to begin with this propaganda sowing the soil to enable the state of Israel to do what we're doing right now. They're going to submit these stereotypes and tropes that all Palestinians are Hamas. Right? That Israelis are the victims. Right? I made the mistake, and look, I'm, part of the reason I took to social media, and I'm on platforms like Instagram and Twitter, I don't like doing it, to be honest with you. I mean, it's not what I enjoy doing, right? I'd rather be watching sports or uh, visiting my family, but I do it because I have to do it. I do it because I know that Western media outlets, the corporate media outlets, are not only unfair to us, that's an understatement. That's an understatement. Statement. They're fully invested in our nation. They want to make us look bad. They want to say we're terrorists. They want to say that that isn't our land. They want to affirm and legitimize lies that enable these militaries to kill and bomb our people and they collateral damage. Who, raise your hands. Who's seen videos or images of young babies charred by white phosphorus? Who's seen videos and images of young children being injured and killed? Who's seen images and videos of elder grandmothers and grandfathers walking the streets being by themselves in the world? They see collateral damage. To me, the most painful thing is they call our children human shields. They can't even honor us in death to say these are fatalities, these are victims of these bombings. You don't want to call it a genocide? Cool, I'm with you. Don't do it. Don't do it. But at least victimize, but at least humanize who are killed. 
And I know black people in the room are not surprised by this because that's what they did to Trayvon Martin. That's what they do with George Floyd, right? Part of the design of ethnic cleansing, part of the project of genocide is to dehumanize the individuals before they're killed. Because if you accomplish that, then no one's going to have sympathy or compassion for the kill people. They're actually, they're actually going to applaud it and desire it because they view them through the lens of terrorism in the instance of Arabs and Muslims, and they view our black brothers and sisters shot down on the streets of places like Minneapolis, Detroit, where I'm from, all across the United States, but also in Canada, through the lens of criminality. If you, if you dehumanize the person first, you've already succeeded in the subsequent project of shooting them down and killing them. One of, my, one of my heroes is Palestinian poet Mahmoud Darwish. Anybody know Mahmoud Darwish is? Please raise your hands. If you don't know who it is, young people, please read Mahmoud Darwish. Young people in the room, it's, it's, it's high time for you to read our giants, read our intellectuals, read our thinkers, know that language. Mahmoud Darwish has this beautiful quote, and it's something that I've lived by. This has been my slogan for the last 13 days since Gaza has been bombed. Darwish wrote, if you live, live free, or die like the tree standing up, or die like the trees standing up. The olive tree in Palestine has tremendous symbolic significance. It's a metaphor for the people, how deeply rooted they are in the land, how strong the trunks are how far stretching the branches are. They signify that even though you've dehumanized and dis displaced these people, they're not going anywhere. And this week I told myself, and trust me, I'm, I'm under a lot of risk. I've gotten death threats, 20s, 30, 40 by the day. Some of these Zionists and Islamophobes, and I got a lot of enemies because I, Yani, uh, I, I choose all the wrong uh, issues to champion, right? Hindutva, the Chinese, because I talk about the Uyghur Muslim genocide as well. I've gotten death threat after death threat this week. Family members have gotten texts and direct messages. Two nights ago, I got a, I, I got a DM in my uh, Instagram from an anonymous photo showing a photo of the front uh, the entrance of the apartment building that I live in with two words that say, be careful. Right? So I know, I know that part of the game is silence, silencing us, suppressing our voices, making sure that people like me don't take the time to share the images, to share the narratives that have been buried for so long. You know, I'm, I'm not going to lie to you, right? I'm, I, uh, alhamdulillah, like, I, I think I'm a strong guy. Like, I'm getting older, so I'm not as strong as I once used to be. I'm not somebody who cowers under fear, right? But I have family members. And sometimes I think twice, should I post this? Am I putting myself or my mother or my sister or my loved ones in jeopardy if I do this? But as soon as that thought creeps into my head, I think about these brave journalists in Gaza. You guys have all seen the really courageous, and this brother, man, and, and you know, inshallah, and he stays with us for a long time. Brother Mu'taz, Aziza, that brother has done transformative work in bringing our stories and bringing what's happening in real time in Gaza to the forefront. That brother, and he's a friend now, he was missing for 10 hours. And I thought, did this bomb at this hospital take his life? Did a, did a rocket take his life? Did a sniper shoot him down? Because if I'm getting these threats, if I'm getting this pressure, that brother is getting it a hundredfold. And he's still going forward. And he's still standing. And he's still posting. 
And he's still showing images in real time of children being rescued from the rubble. If he's putting his life on the line in the very heart where war is taking place, and I can't put my life on the line in the comforts of the United States, where I have a warm meal and I have hot water, no threat of electricity. I'm not trying to minimize my threat. It's there, but it's a hundredfold for that brother. He's Muslim. I'm Muslim, right? It's only Hus from Allah that I live here and he lives there. Could very easily be the reverse. I'll share a story with you guys. Right? I don't share this story much publicly. And please cut me off. I, I'm a professor, so I talk for a long time. Feel free to cut me off. When I was young, I'm half Lebanese. When I was young, we spent two years living uh, in Lebanon during the Civil War. Everybody remember, young folks, you may not remember, but there was a civil war in Lebanon through the 70s and the 80s. Israel got involved because the PLO moved into Lebanon, into Beirut, and set up their headquarters there. I lived in Beirut at that time from 86 to 88, some of the most intense years of fighting for that war. I vividly remember, and whenever I see images of war, whenever I see children being killed and being maimed, I vividly have memories still today, and I may even have PTSD. I don't know, maybe all Muslims probably have some degree of PTSD, right? But I vividly remember the sound of Israeli jets soaring above our building. I vividly remember the sound of sirens foreshadowing and signaling that an attack was taking place. I remember how it felt to sleep in, uh, to sleep in shelters when bombs were considerable. I vividly remember seeing homeless kids selling chiclets gum on the street to make it and to make it into the next day. I vividly remember seeing men who have lost their legs tying themselves to skateboards to make it around the city. I vividly remember 50 and 60 year old mothers with hijab selling whatever they could on the street, being stripped of their dignity. Any woman at that age should be at home with her children and grandchildren living a peaceful life. But I remember what these wars did in decimating and humiliating our people. I remember this. And because I remember this and remember more, it drives me to speak, confront the threat, and raise up Palestine and the people of Gaza in every and any way that I can. And I'm only here today. do the same. Our dean gives us the greatest blessing, which is a commitment to racial justice, to social justice, and to equality, especially when those who are being pummeled by it are the most vulnerable, violated, and oppressed people in the world. If you don't do something or say something, I'm going to be frank with you. Okay. If you don't do something, say something, donate something, you are enabling genocide. That's a hard line position, I know. But we, brothers and sisters, were at a moment in history where you have to take a side. You have to take a side of some kind. Whether it's you, if you have somebody with a, if you're somebody with a mass following, post, speak up. If you're somebody with millions and millions of dollars, donate to make sure that the water that is being depleted in Gaza, the electricity that is being depleted, can be tended to. If you're somebody who is a corporate executive and has access to individuals who are non-Muslims in those spaces, move and mobilize them. Whatever it is you can do, we have to do something because we're staring genocide in the face. And if we don't do something, the Palestinian people may no, no longer exist on that plot of land. So I close by saying I'm here and I'm proud to be here with Penny Appeal Canada, right? All of us should be not only donating to Penny Appeal Canada, but uplifting this organization for being a robust and strong vehicle for uplifting the Palestinian people. Thank you so much. Wassalamu alaikum. Do I have time to answer questions?